Just as a reminder, number 337, if you'll mark that, it'll be the song at the close of the lesson. Uh, so this being the last lesson of the this group, uh, we were asking Aaron to give us an invitation at the end of his lesson. <clears throat> Aaron Birch is an, another graduate of this school and uh, after his graduation from West Virginia School of Preaching he uh, went to Freed Hardeman uh, earning both his bachelor's degree and recently his uh, MDiv. Uh, he is married to his wife Catherine. They have six children Esther, Hannah, Lydia, Tabitha, Timothy, and David. And I wish that they would have named a couple of kids Bible names, don't you? <laughs> In fact, uh, I heard that Aaron even named his dog moreover after the one in Luke 16. <laughs> anyway, Aaron is a marvelous student of the Bible. He was a joy to have uh, as a student here. And we are very thankful that he is both prepared and willing and able to teach our Greek classes. And uh, I urge you to give him all of your attention, Aaron. One of our other faculty members, uh, when he and his wife were expecting, told me that I didn't leave him any more names. I'm not certain that's quite true, but uh, thank you, Dan, for your, your kind words. I appreciate very much the opportunity to be able to, to be here today and the opportunity to speak. Uh, thank you to the elders here at the Hillview Terrace uh, congregation. Thank you to Andy and to, to Brother Kenny and for all of those on the lectureship committee for the opportunity to speak. I would encourage you, if you have your Bible, to open it to Psalm 118. The focus of our study this hour is that psalm. That particular psalm is one of what's called the Hallel Psalms, the praise psalms in the book of Psalms. It's a psalm of thanksgiving, a psalm of praise. It has an invitation at the very beginning to praise God. And then it gives reasons or the rationale for praising God. Why? Should we offer Him praise? And at the end of the psalm, the psalmist returns once again to call upon the people to praise God. There's not a lot historically, as far as the historical background is concerned, that we know about Psalm 118. There's no titles. There's no indication of the purpose or the writer of the psalm. But when we look closely at the internal contents of the psalm, we find that it was, comes from an individual that was struggling, a person that seems to have suffered some difficult, perhaps even life-threatening circumstance or situation. In verse 5, the psalmist says, I called on the Lord in distress. In verse 10, all the nations surrounded me. In verse 11 and verse 12, they surrounded me again. Verse 13, you pushed me violently. Verse 18, the Lord has chastened me severely. After facing whatever situation it was that he faced, God delivered him. God saved him. In verse 5, he says, The Lord answered me and set me in a broad place. In verse 13, the Lord helped me. Verse 18, He has given, not given me over to death. And in verse 21, You have answered me and have become my salvation. Although we might not know a whole lot more about the historical background of Psalm 118, what the author reveals to us is that he would praise God, he would give thanks, he would worship God because of God's salvation, because of God's response. He is thankful and desires to worship Him. Some have pointed out as well that perhaps the psalm was at least written in part to be a congregational hymn. The psalm itself suggests a possible congregational setting and is very similar to other portions of psalms found in the Old Testament. For example, in Ezra chapter 3 and verse 11, 1 Chronicles chapter 16 verse 34, and 2 Chronicles chapter 5 verse 13 and chapter 7. 
in verse 3, the author uses repeatedly the first person pronouns, we and us. And so he's calling others to join him in praise to God. In verse 1 and verse 29, he uses second person imperatives. Give thanks to the Lord. And so he's calling upon others to praise God. Yet at the same time, we need to recognize that the psalm has a very individual, personal focus for the psalmist. He uses repeatedly the first person pronouns, I, me, and my. He uses the pronoun I in verse 5, 6, verse 7, verse 10, verse 11, verse 12, verse 13, verse 17, verse 19, verse 21, verse 25, and verse 28. And so he's calling on others to praise God, to join him in praising God, but it has a very intense individual focus. Perhaps then, or it seems, that what he's trying to do is that the author is using his own circumstances, his own personal experience to call other people to praise God. He's expressing his own distress, his own deliverance, and using that as an example as to why people ought to call and praise God. The psalmist focuses on his past he focuses on his present, the salvation that God has brought. And he focuses on the present intention to worship and praise God. And he instructs the people to do the same. He uses a couple of key poetic and grammatical constructions to enforce upon his hearers, his readers, the importance of praising God. In verse 1 and also in verse 29, he uses identical phraseology to call upon the others to praise Him. In verse 1 he says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His mercy endures forever. And in verse 29 he returns to that again. He says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His mercy endures forever forever, he impacts upon his hearers, upon his readers, the necessity, the importance of giving thanks to God and repeats it twice. He uses a poetic structure called inclusio in verse 1 and verse 29. Inclusio is to use the same words to begin and to end a section or here to begin and end a psalm. It calls again emphasis to the purpose, to the key ideas of the section. It indicates where he begins and where he ends. And with his call to praise, it's a summarization to worship and to give thanks to God. He also uses another poetic structure called refrain. We see that first in verse 1. In verse 1 at the end of the verse, he says, For His mercy endures forever. He repeats that again. In verse 2, His mercy endures forever. Verse 3, His mercy endures forever. Verse 4, His mercy endures forever. And he returns to that again at the end. In verse 29, For His mercy endures forever. That refrain, that repeated phrase, again, does the same thing that the inclusio does. It brings emphasis. It provides structure. And it invites, perhaps as well, if this was intended as a congregational hymn, it invites the participation of the people. God's mercy endures forever. That phrase sets, perhaps, the key to the entirety of Psalm 118. That expression is offering the reason why God is worthy of praise. Why the psalmist calls upon the people to praise God. They are to praise Him for His mercy endures forever. The psalmist places the reason, the necessity to give thanks to God, to offer Him the praise that He deserves for His acts of mercy and salvation the term translated mercy here is perhaps one of the most important terms in the Old Testament Bible. It occurs 450 times in the Old Testament and nearly 130 times just in the book of Psalms alone. It has to do with covenant love. It has to do with the love God has for His people. The mercy, the long-suffering, the kindness that He shows them. I encourage you, when you have opportunity, to look at other translations 
in regard to this word, even in this psalm. It's translated in other passages as mercy here in the New King James Version. The New American Standard Bible and the Old American Standard Version translated as loving kindness. The English Standard Version and the RSV translated as steadfast love. The NIV renders it simply as love. And the New English Translation translates it as loyal love. The Septuagint, the Old Testament translation into Greek, translated it with the Greek term eleos meaning mercy or compassion or pity. God's covenant love, His steadfast love, His mercy, is the love that He shows His people. And it's connected very closely to His covenant that He's made with His people, with His faithfulness and His love that He shows them. In the book of Deuteronomy, in Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 9, Moses explicitly connects God's love, His faithfulness, His loyalty... His mercy to the covenant that He makes with His people. When He said, therefore know, or Moses said, therefore know that the Lord your God, He is God. The faithful God who keeps covenant and mercy for a thousand generations with those who love Him and keep His commandments. You see, God demonstrates His love, His mercy to those who are His people to those who are in covenant relationship with Him. That doesn't mean, of course, that other nations, other peoples, those who are not His people, don't have His love. But we, especially those who are His people, have His covenant relationship with Him and experience His covenant love. That covenant love expresses itself in relationship, in obligation, even in human relationships. This term is used to refer to loyalty, to obligation, to relationship. It expressed the relationship that David had with Jonathan in 2 Samuel 9 and verse 1. The relationship that Abraham had with his wife Sarah in Genesis 20 and verse 13. And other family members like a father and son between Jacob and Joseph in Genesis 47 and verse 29 and especially the relationship that God's people have with Him. It expresses as well loyalty and faithfulness. In Ruth chapter 2 and verse 20, Naomi said in the English Standard Version about Boaz, May he be blessed by the Lord, whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. What Naomi recognized with Boaz was when he let Ruth glean in his fields, that he was expressing that covenant love, that obligation, that loyalty, that faithfulness that the kinsmen were to have for one another and for their relations. God has that same type of mercy. He expresses that same type of faithfulness and loyalty. He did to Abraham in Genesis 24 and verse 27. David in Psalm 89 verse 20 through 24. And in the prophets, He promised it to Israel in Jeremiah 31 verse 3 and verse 4. And Isaiah 63 and verse 7 through 8. That mercy involves God's forgiveness, the kindness that He shows His people when they sin. In Exodus chapter 34, verse 6 and verse 7, God described Himself as the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth. And then He made this statement, keeping mercy for thousands. How does God do that? How does God show mercy? Well, He continues and says, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. God's loving kindness... His steadfast love, His covenant love, when we repent, demonstrates itself in His mercy and His forgiveness that He shows us. His mercy also shows up in remembrance and deliverance. According to the psalmist in another passage in Psalm 106 and verse 45, God delivered Israel from the peoples that He had allowed to afflict them because of this. He said He remembered His covenant. There's that covenant aspect, the covenant love. God remembered His covenant and relented according to the multitude of His mercies. In Psalm 69 and verse 13 and 14, the psalmist said again, But as for me, my prayer is to you, O Lord, in the acceptable time. O God, in the multitude of your mercy, hear me in the truth of your salvation. Deliver me out of the mire and let me not sing. You see, because God has covenant love for His people, He's loyal, He's faithful. 
He remembers. He delivers. And He saves. And throughout all of that, even when we are unfaithful, He's long-suffering after Israel had suffered through the siege of Jerusalem and all the horrors that it endured, the writer of Lamentation wrote in Lamentation chapter 3 and verse 22, Through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed because of His compassions. Fail not. The psalmist calls upon the people in Psalm 118 to praise God to praise God for His goodness, for His mercy endures forever. God's mercy, His faithfulness, His covenant love that He has to His people or for His people is not without condition. He requires His people to be faithful. He requires His people that when they sin, to repent. He requires them to love Him. Deuteronomy 7 and verse 9. He requires them to keep His commandments. But when they do, the psalmist says, His mercy endures forever. There's no end to it. There's no end to God's covenant love for His people. Well, we might stop as we get to verse 1, where the psalmist says, Praise the Lord, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His mercies endure forever. How is the psalmist certain of that? How does he know that God's mercy endures forever? How does he know that God is good? What has God done? What gives him evidence that such is true? When we look closely at Psalm 118, what we find is that he draws the evidence that God's mercy endures forever. He draws the evidence that God is good from the, His own experience in life, from what God has done for Him. He begins in verse 1 and verse 4 again, simply with the call to praise God. He expresses it in four different ways. He begins in verse 1 and says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord. A simple general call for people to give thanks, to offer praise to God. In verse 2, though, he becomes more specific. He says, Let Israel now say, His mercy endures forever. Verse 3, even more specific. Let the house of Aaron now say, His mercy endures forever. And in verse 4, he says, Let those who fear the Lord now say, His mercy endures forever forever. In his initial call in verse 1, it's simply general. Give thanks to the Lord. There's no specific subject as to who it is that's supposed to give thanks. But to whom, that is, the object of their praise, he does clarify. They're to give thanks to the Lord. Lord here is the term that is on occasion translated Jehovah or in some other versions of the Scriptures translated Yahweh. It's the name by which God would be made known to Israel. It is His covenant name. The name that would demonstrate His relationship to Him. The name that's apparently based upon His self-expression of Himself as I am that I am. He is the existing God. The One who was and is and will be. And would be known to Israel as the Lord. The Lord emphasizes God's eternality. It emphasizes His sovereignty. He is the God who is. The Lord, that name for God, His divine name is extremely important as far as Psalm 119, or 118 is concerned. Just as the psalmist refers to himself numerous times throughout the psalm by referring to I and me and my, he does the same in reference to God. He uses the divine name Lord 19 times in 29 verses. And then six more times he uses the shortened version, Yah, of the same with the same meaning. In the New King James Version, both of those are translated as Lord. And so 25 times in 29 verses, the psalmist makes reference to God's divine name. It's the Lord that He calls upon the people to praise. It is the Lord to whom they should give thanks. There is one difference, important difference, in verse 1 through verse 4. And that is the people to whom He calls to give praise to God. 
Again, in verse 1, he begins with a general call. Give thanks, give praise, offer praise to God. And in verse 2, he's more specific. He says, let Israel now say. And so he calls upon God's people. He calls upon Israel, God's nation, to give Him thanks, to offer Him praise. Verse 3, he's more specific. He calls specifically upon the house of Aaron, the high priesthood, Aaron's sons, to give thanks to God. Verse 4, he then calls upon those who fear the Lord. Some see the phrase here as referring perhaps to Gentile God-fearers. I assume though, or think perhaps in my opinion, that maybe that's... Um, looking at it from a later standpoint, even if Psalm 118 was written in an early post-exilic period, I mean, in other words, shortly after the exile, the likelihood of having a great group of those who fear, the, fear God or those who are Gentiles that haven't proselytized probably isn't that great. We certainly see that when we come to the book of Acts, though. There's a great group of peoples throughout the world where Paul and the other apostles travel that are God-fears. Maybe there's another emphasis here, if we think about it enough. The books of the wisdom literature, of course, make emphasis upon the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is an important theme throughout the books of wisdom. In Job, Job 28 and verse 28, Job said, Fear of the Lord is wisdom. The psalmist would say in Psalm 111 and verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The same in Proverbs 9 and verse 10. The Proverbs writer would say in Proverbs 1 and verse 7, the, begin the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. From a negative perspective, the Proverbs writer also says in Proverbs 8 and verse 13, that the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. From a positive perspective, Proverbs 14 and verse 27, the fear of the Lord is the fountain of life. It brings life. To turn one away from the snares of death. Proverbs 19 verse 23, the fear of the Lord leads to life. The writer of Ecclesiastes closes his book by saying, Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole of man. When you think about the fear of the Lord, we're talking about obedience to God. And I want you to think about how the psalmist begins here in verse 1 through verse 4. He calls upon, in verse 2, he calls upon Israel. Think about this for a moment. Did all of Israel fear God the way they should? What about verse 3? He calls upon the house of Aaron. Did all the house of Aaron, did all of those who were of the high priestly family, did they all fear God the way they should? Leviticus chapter 10 emphasizes very beginning that they didn't, right? Nadab and Abihu didn't fear God the way they should have. And so it seems to me that in verse 4, the psalmist is becoming more specific. He calls upon Israel. He calls upon the house of Aaron and he says, those of you who fear God, who keep His commandments, who seek to be wise, who seek to find life, praise God. Why should they do that though? Why should they praise Him? He clearly sets that in the goodness and the mercy of God, for His mercy endures forever. And He uses Himself as an example. Beginning in verse 5, He talks about His own distress and deliverance as a reason to praise God. There are other psalms that follow a very similar pattern to Psalm 118. They'll call upon the people to praise God. They'll make the same statement for His mercy endures forever. But then they go in a different direction. They talk about what God has done for the nation of Israel. The psalmist here in 118 doesn't do that. He talks about himself. He begins in verse 5. He says, I called on the Lord in distress. The Lord answered me and set me in a broad place. We don't know specifically what the psalmist endured. We don't know exactly what it was that he had suffered. Distress, the term here, can refer to any number of different issues or circumstances that might be difficult, that a person might face. The Babylonian captivity is described in Lamentations chapter 1 and verse 3 with the same word. The psalmist's near-death experience in another passage in Psalm 116 and verse 3 is described by the same word. The verbal form that's related to the term for distress here is also used to refer even to human relationships. 
For example, the fear that Jacob felt as he approached coming home in Genesis chapter 32 and verse 8, and he knew that Esau was coming out to meet him. He faced distress. Israel felt the same thing after God allowed them to be repeatedly defeated by the nations of the land in the book of Judges. In Judges chapter 2 and verse 15 and Judges 10 and verse 9. Interestingly, Amnon, the son of David, was distressed over the feelings that he had for Tamar. 2 Samuel 13 and verse 2. And David himself, when the Amalekites destroyed the city of Ziklag where David and his men were living. And then his men, based upon what had happened, the destruction of their city and the taking of the, their possessions and their families by the Amalekites, they wanted to kill David. And in 1 Samuel chapter 30 and verse 6, the text tells us that he was distressed. Same verbal form. We don't know exactly what it was that the psalmist faced. But whatever it was that he faced appears to have been caused, at least in part, by people. In verse 6, he asks the question, he says, The Lord is on my side, I will not fear. What can man do to me? In other words, it appears people are doing this to him. The same thing in verse 7, he talks about people who hate him. Verse 10, he says, All the nations surround me. In verse 12, he echoes that again, They surrounded him like bees. And then in verse 13, he comes back and he says, You pushed me violently that I might fall, but the Lord helped me. Whatever distress it was that he was experiencing was at least in part caused by people. But he acknowledges something else as well. In verse 18, he acknowledges that God is least, at least is involved to some degree. He says, the Lord has chastised me. In other words, He's disciplined me severely, but He has not given me over to death. In one way or another, whatever is being done to the psalmist, he sees what is being done at least in part is God's corrective discipline. That God is allowing him to suffer these things. But he also recognizes as well that in this distress that God has allowed in his life, it's God and God alone that has delivered him. In verse 5, he simply says, I called on the Lord in distress. The Lord answered me. Those two things are the key components of Psalm 118. I was in distress, but what did God do? God answered. In verse 18, at the end of the verse, he says in the second line, but he has not given me over to death. Whatever has happened to the psalmist, whatever distress it is that he's experiencing, he recognizes that people have caused this problem and God has allowed it. Perhaps it's in part God's discipline of him. It's God's correction. But God at the same time has delivered him. And because of God's response, he makes four assertions. In verse 6 he says, The Lord is on my side. I think, if I remember correctly, and I'll probably quote this wrong, but I think... It was the president, Abraham Lincoln, that said he wasn't concerned about God being on his side, but he was concerned about him being on God's side. The psalmist says here, he says, the Lord is on my side. God, God's with me. Like so many of God's faithful people throughout history, God had made a promise and kept His promise that He would be with him, that He would be present, and He would experience His care. And so he had no need for concern. The second assertion comes in verse 7. He says, The Lord is for me among those who help me. You have to think about that a little bit. It's kind of an awkward phrase from our standpoint. What the psalmist is saying is that there are people, there is a group of individuals that assist him, that help him. And God is one of those. God is one of those individuals who help him. Now, if you think about that enough, it's not just that God is one of those, is it? But God is the greatest of them. God is His helper. God will take care of Him. God will defeat His enemies. And God will deliver Him. The third assertion is in verse 13. He says, but the Lord helped me. Part of the insertion, or part of the noticing 
the height of the assertion is recognizing what he said in the beginning of the verse. He talked about the nations. He said, you pushed me violently. That is those who were opposed to him. You pushed me violently that I might fall. But what did God do? People were against him. People surrounded him. The nations surrounded him. But God delivered him. God helped me. Verse 13. The fourth assertion is in verse 14. The Lord, the psalmist said, is my strength and my song, and He has become my salvation. The psalmist actually quotes here from part of the song of Moses, which Moses and the Israelites sang after the exodus from Egyptian bondage. Like Moses in ancient Israel, God is the author of the psalmist's strength. And He's the author of the psalmist's song. What is the reason that he can praise God? What is the reason that he can offer God worship? What is the reason that he calls upon others to do it? It's because God is his strength and God is his song. And God is his salvation. God's deliverance has had an impact upon the psalmist. His strength, his salvation has impacted him in his life. Because of what God has done, God has given him confidence. He says in verse 6 again, I will not fear what can man do to me. The implication is they can't do anything. It reminds me of what Jesus told the disciples, do not fear those who can only kill the body, but fear Him who can kill both body and soul in hell. Men can't do anything to Him. Verse 7, His confidence is, I shall see my desire upon those who hate me. God will defeat His enemies. In the name of the Lord, or by God's power, verse 10, verse 11, and verse 12, I will destroy them. The psalmist states in verse 12, they will be quenched like a fire of thorns. Their fire has no strength or power. Before God they will fizzle out like little twigs. People, people, even rulers, even princes, the psalmist doesn't have the same level of confidence in. He says about them in verse 8 and verse 9 that to put confidence in people or princes is unseemly. While men and princes cannot provide success and deliverance, God can. And so his confidence is in God. God's deliverance also provides him not only with confidence, but also with joy. In verse 15 and 16, he says, The voice of rejoicing and salvation is in the tents of the righteous. He pictures here Israel after experiencing a great battle and experiencing great victory returning to their tents. Rejoicing over their victory. Rejoicing over God giving them success. And he says, I experienced that same joy. God has done the same thing for me. They shout, they declare, the right hand of the Lord does valiantly. God's mighty arm has delivered them from their enemies. And the psalmist enjoys that same joy. God's deliverance also then compels him to praise. Why is it that he's driven to praise God? Why is it that he's driven to call others to praise God? And it has to do with God's deliverance. God's deliverance compels him to seek to worship God. Verse 17, he says, I shall not die. God's going to deliver me. But what am I going to do? I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord, His enemies, you see, will not succeed. They will be defeated, but He will be exalted and He will praise the works of God. Being compelled to do such, to worship God, to praise Him, leads Him, beginning in verse 19, to express His eagerness to praise God. Because God has delivered him from this distress, he wants to praise God. He's enthusiastic. He's zealous. I suppose we ought to make application to ourselves, right? Hasn't God delivered us from our enemy? Hasn't God delivered us from sin? What, we, what ought we be compelled to do? What ought we to be eager, zealous, enthusiastic to do? Perhaps if we took the right view of that, it might change our worship, don't you suppose? The psalmist says, I'm eager to praise God. In verse 19, 
He calls upon the gates to be opened. He says, open to me the gates of righteousness. The gates would appear to be either the gates to the tabernacle or perhaps later the gates to the temple. But what he's asking is that they be opened so that he could enter to worship. So that he could enter to give God the praise that he deserved. In verse 21, he expresses the reason for his desire. He says, I will praise you. Why? For you have answered me and have become my salvation. He recognizes what God has done. God has answered him. God has responded to him. God has saved him. And so it's led to his desire and his thankfulness to praise and to worship God. In verse 22, he uses a metaphor of the stone. Verse 22, he says, The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. As far as what exactly the metaphor means, I found a great explanation, I think, in the New English translation of the Bible. They have footnotes with explanations. And I think this is a good one. They said the metaphor of the stone... The builders discarded describes the way in which God's deliverance reversed the psalmist's circumstances. He was in distress. He was like a stone which was discarded by builders as useless. But now that he has been vindicated by God, all that can see that he is of special importance to God, like the cornerstone of a building. If you've ever been around construction, you can imagine somebody finding perhaps a board that's no good. Or maybe a cinder block that's cracked. And so they discard it to the side. That's useless. It's no good. The psalmist said, that's what they did to me. They discarded me. They set me aside. They didn't see me as valuable. Well, what did God do? God made me the chief cornerstone of His building. God had accomplished this. He says, by His doing, verse 23, and this was the day that God had made. The NET notes again, it says, though sometimes applied in a general way, this statement, that is the statement, this is the day, in its context refers to the day of deliverance, which which the psalmist and people celebrate. Man, in contrast to God, stood in marvelous amazement of what God had done. And the righteous found it a reason to rejoice and be glad. Based upon what God had done, The psalmist also makes a petition in verse 25. He asks God, he says, Save now, I pray. O Lord, I pray, send now prosperity. The psalmist's own experience demonstrates God's covenant love and he calls upon God to continue to save them, to continue to deliver them. In verse 26, he makes another request. He says, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. It's not exactly clear, at least in this text so far, who it is that he seeks to bless. It could be the king. It could be perhaps the high priest or another priest. Or it could simply be a blessing upon those who have come to worship God. But he simply makes a request that they be blessed. Verse 6, he makes an assertion that has to do with the basis of his worship for God. He says, God is the Lord. God is different than the false gods. God is different than the idols. God is Lord. And He has given us light. Verse 27, bind the sacrifice with cords to the horn of the altar. In other words, what it seems that He's saying is, God is Lord. He's the supreme deity. Therefore, let us sacrifice. Eddie Cloer in his commentary on Psalms said the idea of bind the sacrifice could be start the sacrifice. Start the worship. Begin the worship. God is worthy. God is Lord. Verse 7, he returns to his... Or verse 28, he returns to his key desire again. He makes the statement similar to what he did in verse 27. He says, you are my God. What am I going to do then? I will praise you. You are my God. I will exalt you. You see, he has a relationship He has that covenant with God. And God, in keeping faithfulness to the covenant, has delivered him from his distress. And now he says, now's my part. Here's my relationship to God. He's my God. He is Lord. I will worship Him. 
With the final verse, in verse 29, he returns with a final call to praise God. He says, O oh God, O oh give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His mercy endures forever. With the final verse, he returns to where he began. He returns to that call to praise God. God in His goodness and His mercy has delivered the psalmist from distress. And because of that, he desires to worship God. And he calls upon others to do the same. Although we don't know exactly what the historical background of Psalm 118 was, the New Testament's application of Psalm 118 is unmistakable. It's clear that the New Testament applies Psalm 118 unreservedly to Jesus. From the standpoint of the New Testament writers, Psalm 118 is messianic. It's cited at least 13 times in the New Testament. And it's applied to Jesus by multiple different speakers and multiple different writers. Portions of the psalm are applied to Jesus by Jesus Himself in passages like Matthew 23 and verse 39, Luke 13 and verse 35, Luke 20 and verse 17. It's applied to Jesus by the apostles like Peter in Acts chapter 4 and verse 11 and in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4 through 8. It's applied by the apostle Paul to Jesus in Ephesians 2 and verse 20 and verse 21. And perhaps most astounding at all, of all, or most certain of all, it's applied by John to Jesus in John chapter 12 and verse 13. John cites Psalm 118 verse 25 and 26. He also quotes in part from the book of Isaiah as well. But he makes this statement. After those two quotations in verse 16, he makes this statement. He says, His disciples did not understand these things at first, but... When Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written, notice, about Him. What was the psalmist writing about? What was Isaiah writing about? They were writing about Jesus. Perhaps the importance of what they wrote then is that what they suggest Psalm 118 implies about Jesus when we look at the way that they apply Psalm 118, what we find is that they apply it to Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem before His crucifixion. In Matthew chapter 21 and verse 9, as, peop, as Jesus is drawing near to Jerusalem, the people praise Him saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Now that... Might, you might look at that and say, how's that a reference to Psalm 118? It has to do with the word Hosanna. Hosanna comes from Psalm 118 and verse 25. The words in the New King James Version, Save now, I pray, O Lord. Save now, I pray. Are transliterated from Hebrew as Hosanna. When they were saying Hosanna, the Son of David, or to the Son of David. They were making reference back to Psalm 118. In Luke chapter 19 and verse 38, Luke records that not only do they make reference to verse 25, but they also make reference to verse 26. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now interestingly, in Luke's account, they add a little bit. Luke says they state, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. What I want you to put together from that is this. Who are they declaring Jesus to be? They're declaring Jesus to be the King. They're declaring Jesus to be the Son of David. They're declaring Jesus to be the Christ, the Messiah, the One for whom they had been awaiting. According to Psalm 118, Jesus is King. But He's not just King. Jesus Himself applies... Psalm 118, to the punishment that He Himself would bring against the Jews for rejecting Him. In the book of Matthew, in Matthew chapter 21, Jesus delivers, especially against the Jewish leaders, what's called the parable of the vine dressers. And He Himself, in Matthew 21 and verse 42, cites Psalm 118, 
He says to the Jewish leaders, he says, Have you never read in the Scriptures? The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our sight. Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. And whoever falls on this stone shall be broken, but on whomever it falls, it will grind him to powder. In the parable, he had told about the vine dresser who sent people to warn the evil vine dressers, the owner of the vineyard had sent them. And ultimately, he sends the heir to them. But they have, those vine dressers take the heir and they kill him. What is going to happen to them? what would happen is that they would fall upon the chief cornerstone. That they would be broken. Verse 44. Another way of saying the same thing is that Jesus is the victor. It doesn't matter who the enemy is. It doesn't matter who was against Him. Jesus is the victor. All the nations may surround Him. Psalm 118. All the nations may oppose Him. But who's going to win in the end? It's Jesus. Psalm 118 declares that Jesus is King. Psalm 118 declares that Jesus is the victor. Psalm 118 declares that Jesus is the Savior. We already noticed Matthew chapter 21 and verse 9. The people declare, Hosanna. They're calling upon Jesus to save now, I pray. The Apostle Peter in Acts chapter 4 It's going to cite Psalm 118 as well. In verse 10, he begins describing Jesus. He says, Let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by Him this man stands here before you whole. And so he's talking about Jesus. What you need to notice is verse 11. Verse 11, he says, This is the stone. Who's the stone? Jesus is the stone. Jesus is the stone which, the, which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Then verse 12, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name given among men, or under heaven given among men, by which we must be saved. What's he saying? He's saying Jesus is Savior. Psalm 118 declares that Jesus is King. It declares that Jesus is Victor. It declares that Jesus is Savior. And it declares as well that Jesus is the foundation. In both Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20 and 21, and 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4 through verse 10, Paul and Peter both recognize the foundational importance of Jesus as the chief cornerstone. They say that He is the foundation of God's household, the foundation of God's temple, the foundation of His spiritual house, the foundation of His priesthood, the foundation of His holy people, the foundation of His chosen generation, the foundation of His own special people. You see, although Jesus was rejected by the Jews, although He might be rejected by all the world, although He might be rejected by the nations, although they might persecute Him, although they might stand against Him, Jesus is the foundation. He's the foundation of the church. He's the foundation of all the blessings that God offers to Him. And He's the foundation of salvation. It's similar to what Peter would say. And Jesus would respond to. In Matthew chapter 16, and verse 16 and verse 18, Peter would say, after Jesus asked him, Who do you say that I am? Peter would say, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And in response to that, Jesus would say, And also I say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. What is the rock? What is the foundation of the church? What is the foundation of God's people? What is the foundation of all spiritual blessings? What is the foundation of our hope? It's Jesus. Jesus is the chief cornerstone. Peter would say it this way. Acts 4 and verse 12. 
There's no other name under heaven given among men by which we might be saved. There's no other way. There's no other foundation. There's no other that can offer salvation, that can offer hope. There's one, and it's Jesus. The Scriptures, of course, are replete with that theme. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 11 that was mentioned already this morning. There is one foundation. There's no other foundation that can be laid. There's one, and it's Christ. Jesus Himself would say in John 14 and verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through Me. There's one way. There's one foundation. There's one cornerstone that leads to life, that leads to salvation. And no other. This morning, if you're not a Christian, there's no other way to God. The Apostle Paul would say in 1 Timothy 2 and verse 5, there's one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. There is no other. If you're not a Christian, we implore you to become one, to turn to Christ, to obey Him and find life through Him. There are only, if you think about it, from Psalm 118, there are only two possibilities as far as Jesus is concerned. He's either the rock that we fall upon and are broken, or He's the rock we bow before and are built upon. There's no other options. There's no third possibility. It's either be broken by Him because we're opposed to Him, or be built up in Him. This morning, if you're not a Christian, we implore you to become one. If you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, are willing to repent of your sins, willing to confess that you believe that He's the Christ, the Son of God, and are willing to be baptized, immersed in water, dipped fully in water for the forgiveness of your sins in His name, based upon who He is as the Christ, the Savior, the Son of God, then you can be raised to newness of life and you can begin to live a new life faithful to Him, built upon Him, serving Him you've done that in the past but have fallen away, we implore you as well to come back. Don't be His enemy. Come back to Him. Make things right. If we can pray for you, let us. Perhaps it's neither of those, but perhaps the difficulties of life have brought you down. Perhaps you feel like you're surrounded by all the nations. Perhaps you may ask the question, what can man do to me? And you may say, a lot. Maybe you need our strength. Maybe you need our help. Maybe you need our encouragement. Won't you let us pray for you as well? This morning we implore you, if you're not a Christian, to come. If you're a Christian and you've fallen away, come. If you need our prayers, come as we stand and sing.